Hey, all you meat lovers out there. In this episode, we take on Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original 1974. We go into whether this is a critique of meat consumption, whether you should become a vegetarian. We explore economic blight in 1970s Texas in great detail. And uh, John takes us on a deep dive into a psychological concept called the gaze. You don't want to miss it. There's also a giant guy with a chainsaw. John? Hello, Brian. It's uh, it's John over here. Hello, John. This is Brian over here. Um, are we anywhere near Texas? My compass has been spinning since we got on this trail, so I couldn't tell you. Well, uh, something horrible happened in Texas, regardless of where we are. A series of horrible chainsaw massacres. Wow. Yeah. Where did you hear about this? Uh, apparently, uh, there were some movies that were based on true stories about these events, these massacres with chainsaws. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I recently watched one of them called Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Have you seen the movie? Actually, I have seen that movie. It's from 1974, so it's almost 50 years old. Jesus Christ, really? Was this uh, one of the first horror movies ever? Can't can't be the first one ever. No, I'm I'm thinking that this movie was amongst a few that came out in the early to mid 70s, maybe post Hammer horror movies. What is Hammer horror? So Hammer horror were these series of horror movies that were based on classical horror tales such as Dracula, Frankenstein. They were black and white. They were in that genre that kind of preceded the late 60s, early 70s kind of horror shift to more of what I would describe a societal threat. Well, what does a hammer have to do with them? The word hammer? Yeah. Because there were hammers in this movie. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's a production company. Oh, I see. Yeah. It was a production company that made a bunch of movies that were of Frankenstein, Dracula, The Mummy, some science fiction, some thrillers, kind of like pre-1970s horrors, mostly in the 60s. So movies like this and Psycho and uh, the zombie movies, Night of the Living Dead movies, were done by many independent film companies? This is like a transition from post-Hammer into independent horror making. There was another transition from post-MC Hammer Hmm. Uh, pre MC Hammer, <laughs> around 1991, I think. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Uh, what was, uh, what was what was pre Hammer? <laughs> the, the sad times where pants fit and uh, and things that were in fact quite legit, in fact quit, and uh, it was just a dark dark time. <laughs> Wow, wow. Yeah. And people are worried about cancel culture today. Uh, right. No, it was a, a different different time. And uh, yeah, so Hammer Horror, you're saying, are are the uh, Dracula uh, black and white kind of movies made by a one, one film production company? Yes. I wouldn't say completely started, but got the ball moving as, as it related to Hollywood horror. Well, I uh, have a review here that touches on kind of the reason why I asked. Quoting this review, strangely, this is a movie that is not actually all that violent. Indeed, it is almost bloodless. Every murder is almost entirely off camera, and the only scenes with blood are a trickle. Ironically, this makes it scarier as your mind fills in the blanks. The most horrifying element is the skeleton and body part art laying about that is the most direct reference to Ed Gein, who I guess was some serial killer in wisconsin that this this movie may or may not have been based on ed gein yeah ed gein okay um seeing where these kind of gore porn movies have gone today uh, i kind of expected yeah more of that you know chainsaws entering flesh and the camera holding the view and all that sort of thing but it was uh it was um delightfully um demure in that sense it, it mm. uh, left the violence off screen and i wonder if that's like because it was 74 and nobody had done this kind of stuff before or if it's uh, you know we we can't we can't cross that bridge yet even though we want to or something like that as movie makers yeah it's difficult to say it definitely has a reputation for being quite violent but it's mostly implied violence yeah except for the meat hook where they put one of the ladies on the meat hook and there's no shot of the hook going into her back but it's not like you can't put two and two together mhm 
but yeah, that uh, lack of blood, I guess, was a relief to me. Not really enjoying those sorts of direct compared to some other movies we've seen. You have a fear of seeing blood? I don't enjoy the uh, sensation of um, body gore, body, body gore. Mm hmm. It doesn't, yeah. uh, you know, I usually raise my hand up to the screen or look away from the screen while it's going on. And uh, I did that a couple times in this movie, especially with the meat hook. But um, then I sort of uh, realized that it's it's not about blood. It's more about tension building scenes and, and disturbing imaginary actions, I guess. So uh, Leatherface is um, a member of a family of, of uh, former slaughterhouse owners, workers. So the description of the family is such that there are two brothers living with their father and their grandparents are in the attic. One is deceased, the grandmother, and the grandfather is holding on by a thread, it seems. Probably the worst dermis condition I've seen and is seemingly unable to even communicate. Age 115, maybe? He requires blood from one of the teenagers to revive not able to really leave his chair or <laughs> talk or eat or wield a hammer or anything, any important life, life skill. And the, the two brothers, one deemed Leatherface, which is the main lead, I guess, or the one that's wielding the chainsaw. And the other one is kind of defined as the hitchhiker who is wandering the community, just sort of uh, taking photographs, I guess, and uh, tormenting passer buyers. It was kind of difficult to know what kind of developmental issues both of them had, but they didn't seem to be at least socially conditioned to where they could just kind of step into a community and act appropriately. Something I'm sure you noticed too, but according to this reviewer, there's no motivation, no background, no speculation on causes evident anywhere in the film. It's simply an exercise in terror, close quote. You know, they seem to have a familiarity with butchering animals, but there's no dwelling on the the possible idea that the family lost their jobs because the animal butcher closed or uh you know economic downturn resulting in in them turning to trying to capture and butcher humans for their barbecue stand you know all of that could have gone into and been developed but none of that was why does he wear a mask why does leatherface wear a mask i took hitchhiker at the beginning to kind of be the scout he goes out and uh hitches on the highway and and marks victims with blood like he did on the side of the van that was meant to be some kind of signal to dad at the uh, barbecue stand slash gas station but none of that really got triggered as that wasn't what precipitated their eventual eventually falling into leatherface's hands they just kind of wandered in to the house and got butchered so i don't know what you what since you made it that part of the movie, the, the the setup hitchhiker guy and marking the van with blood as some kind of signal seemed to get got totally dropped. The one part about the economy when the hitchhiker entered the van and was speaking with the individual who was wheelchair bound, they had a exchange around the way that cows are slaughtered. And the wheelchair guy was saying that the best way is to use a pneumatic gun or an air air gun that well, it essentially brains the cow in a very efficient way. And the hitchhiker was saying, no, the best way is to use a sledgehammer. And part of the reason for using a hammer was because it created jobs that the air gun would remove. Okay. So there might be some reference to them losing employment due to technology. But the hitchhiker going out, possibly fishing for new victims, and marking the van possible. I could see that he self-inflicted a wound to his hand to then wipe blood on on the van so that it can be seen ex externally maybe by the dad at the gas station and then the dad says hey there's no gas here knowing that they couldn't get too far and then well reduces their ability to leave the neighborhood and so you know entrapment in a sense he does invite them in for a nice barbecue dinner then it's like five versus one so maybe he didn't judge that the right time but there was just no connection to them later later stumbling into they went to uh franklin the disabled guy they went to franklin's old family house i took i take it and then mm. leatherface just happened to be hanging out next door so that was the only way they 
stumbled into that. It wasn't because of the hitchhiker's mark on the van. So to kind of engineer this process, hitchhiker is running, running the highways trying to collect victims. He marks a vehicle. The vehicle comes into the gas station. Dad says, hey, look, we don't have any gas. Knowing that there isn't a station nearby, then thinking, oh, these guys are going to either sleep in their van because the dad said maybe tomorrow, maybe in the next yeah. you know, mid-afternoon to keep them near the gas station. Come on, have some food. Everything's great. So that then they have the opportunity. Maybe the beacon of having the generator running in the background to suggest, hey, this house has gas. One of the members of the van party were approaching the barn. His purpose of approachment was, I'll exchange my guitar so that I can get some gas and then we can then come back and repay them. So the allure of going to that house where they got slaughtered was due to the lack of gas. So there is a, a linear process here that the intentionality is difficult to know, but I could see a thread there. There's also the uh, radio announcement at the beginning, the news announcement about graves being dug up and body parts being used in some kind of grisly artistic performance at graveyards. Is that meant to be, I think later on the dad says something to the hitchhiker's son about, you know, you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have done that stuff to the graveyard or, or something like that. So is that the hitchhiker, do you think? Or is that Leatherface? Or are, are, what? what's the purpose of the art at the graveyard if they're just trying to find more meat for their barbecue stand, ultimately? The hitchhiker appears to be a little more eccentric and outgoing than Leatherface. Leatherface feels homebound, maybe due to social anxiety or concern about ability to function outside the home. There is a disconnect between the difference between cows and humans, where animals are animals, whether they're a cow or a human. And so he goes and digs up the bodies to enjoy playing with them. And it's not too uncommon to see children who are fascinated by dead carcasses and such, and maybe the decomposing process. So I think there's a, a general grouping of humans and cows in the same category. So I, I think that him going and digging up bodies shows the um, lack of differentiation as opposed to some signal or some greater purpose to that activity. So you're saying it was, it was, it was hitchhiker guy digging up the bodies? Yeah, I think it was hitchhiker guy. He has uh, elements of like kind of a being a mage, you know, he takes the photo and then sprinkles some accelerant fire accelerant on it and burns it in a, in a puff and then keeps it. And he's got his little satchel, his little leather satchel around his neck or he, and he's got little bones hanging from his body. So there's something, he's kind of like a, a threshold transitional figure. You know, he, he gets you to the house and he maybe is meant to have cast some kind of fatalistic doom on the group by taking the picture and then burning it. There's something, a magical element to him. Hmm. Yeah, I could see that a little necromancer action. Yeah. And then the, the, blood self uh, mutilation and then and then smearing some message with the blood and and if he's the one doing the graveyard art isn't the whole point of their journey to make sure that grandpa one of the girls grandfathers has not been exhumed isn't that kind of why they went on this trip that is the reason why they were going to the graveyard it seems like quite the strange journey to exclusively go to texas just to check on your grandfather's grave as for potential grave robbers but that is the reason why they were there uh, you know it's a strange motivation but that's the stated motivation nonetheless if hitchhikers doing what he does at the graveyards is to you know provide because dad seems opposed to it later on he says you shouldn't have done this stuff at the graveyard you know you're bringing sort of police attention to us but maybe that's why he did it was to have more people come to look and confirm that their beloved family members' graves are not being, and then they can be lured in towards Leatherface. Seems an elaborate way of, <laughs> like, I don't see why they can't just downsize their barbecue shop, raise some pigs and cows and, and chickens or whatever, just on all that land they have and ha run their little barbecue stand. Why, why do they have to, uh, it seems an elaborate way to get your meat. The spiritual element is interesting because it ties into the van crew talking about their horoscopes and mm -hmm. the waning Venus or, or something along the lines of some planetary alignment that 
suggests doom is upon them. And so there's a tie in there between him and the, and the hitchhikers sort of spirituality or ability to curse uh, their group. One other thought that I found online, this is a, about the, about the vegetarian political element, potentially Uh, I'm quoting here. The political satire element is also an understated part of the story. The family were driven to their peculiar habits by automation, destroying their way of life. The quote continues, the association of animal cruelty and murder comes off quite clearly as well. Even if you are a diehard carnivore, it's hard to think of a movie that doesn't make a better case against traditional slaughterhouse activities. There was nothing in the movie, as far as I saw, about automation destroying their way of life. Nothing about closed, shut down slaughterhouses, except for the 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 debate about the sledgehammer versus the air gun, and and like you said, more people being required to wield the sledgehammers. That quote seems to be highlighting that exact scenario of the traditional way of killing cows through a hammer invites a an element of brutality to the process, which then generates out to all animals, including humans. The idea of using a pneumatic gun provides a a distance between myself and the animal and the slaughtering process to where it seems more humane. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, it looks like they're just napping now. I mean, I have never slaughtered a pig, I mean, a cow, so I can't say, but it creates distance that, that maybe through using a hammer contaminates the the brutality of it into the person which then that person carries out in the world and then projects that into humans as being just like cows i think that's what the review is trying to suggest okay well say that's true and and uh the family was displaced from their slaughterhouse job which supported them leatherface only uses the sledgehammer on the first victim uh then he goes towards the chainsaw and and uh, that seems to be the main uh, weapon that he uses. So that that theme of sledgehammer being the good old way of slaughtering flesh is not pursued, not continued. And and then that's one thing, you know, economic dislocation and this family's resorting to finding other sources of meat for their barbecue stand. That's one thing. But this whole, um, like the review, the thing I just quoted leading a viewer to consider vegetarianism or or even just better better treatment of animals i don't know there's some uh is this is this a manifesto for vegetarianism on top of its uh economic (laughs) (laughs) economic setback of this family like are we meant to are we meant to want to be vegetarians after watching this there's an assumption that the family is making sausages out of humans introing the audience of the van group coming to the gas station and then picking up barbecue and then carrying it back and eating it. Then later sliding in the concept that, well, that barbecue is actually human meat. And it's like, wow, really? Well, I accepted the idea that they're eating pig that way, but now that they're eating human that way, that's repulsive. Well, maybe eating pig that way is also repulsive. And so there's an association or maybe a disassociation between the idea of meat being okay if it comes from an animal, meat coming from human is bad. So then uh, maybe meat from animal is bad too. And yeah, so there's a, a current of message there. Not a, not a hard suggestion, but it, and when the um, guy in the wheelchair is walking around, he's got a sausage hanging out of his mouth, <laughs> which looks, you know, it's not inviting. And so, yeah, it's sort of saying eating meat is gross and maybe you should consider not eating meat because Animals are much like humans, and there isn't there isn't a big enough difference there, and and so yeah, so vegetarianism might be more inviting now. Yeah, and the one one scene that I thought really made me feel that was when what's her face, the last victim, is tied up at the at the dinner table, and everybody's she's just screaming her head off, and then there's that scene where they zoom in on her eyes, and and her eyes are just moving around, and and. And then her her uh, the blood vessels within her eyes become the focus of the shot, and I I uh, associated that scene with the 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 terror that uh, an animal might feel as its uh, slaughterer approaches. You know, so that was um, one effective scene in my mind that that made that that bridge that gap between 
uh, the suffering an animal might go through and, and uh, what a human in that situation was going through. Right. And then earlier in the movie, there was shots of cows in the slaughterhouse just kind of mm. standing around as if they were, well, maybe not fully aware, but seemingly aware that their lives were categorically worse off or without purpose or without emotion as they kind of just stare at the camera and don't do very much and slowly like drool and such. So there is almost a dehumanization of cows or making them seem even less animal like. Yeah. I feel like that was kind of a lost opportunity though, because there were no animals around the family home and no scenes of them, even though there was that chicken in the cage and all the bones all over the living room or whatever. There could have been stronger suggestions that they were continuing to slaughter animals. You know, they, if they had some cows in the backyard and a beef hawk mm. hanging on the meat hook next to one of the human victims, like they could have made that equation more explicit that animal meat and human meat, it's all the same. Like they, if, they, if that was something the movie was trying to do, the, the passing scene of the cows, like you just mentioned, was pretty ineffective and, and uh, no animals being actively slaughtered in the house or around the house that was pretty weak in terms of a connection being made. Like I think the, the vegetarianism or just being grossed out by the way meat is acquired in slaughterhouses could have been much more effectively done if it, if it wanted to be done. There could be a slide away from slaughtering cows as an industry and then moving into, well, that hasn't been effective for our family and hasn't provided economic success. So a slow shift into, well, slaughtering humans has actually been more beneficial for us. We are able to get the money that they provide, have the vehicles, you know, eat them and such. And that has become a more sustainable model for us, much like at the dinner scene where there's a lamp and there's a human head or the framework of a, a human head with a light bulb in it, that could easily have been a, a leather lamp. And so they've transitioned fully from sustaining their family on cows and now they're sustaining their family on humans. And it's a it's an easy change for them because <laughs> it it's providing sus a sustaining model that the cows didn't provide. I don't really see how turning to humans for your meat supply is... is easier or cheaper or more sustainable because it draws attention from the police about your activities. There seem to be no lack of cows in the area and, and the cows don't fight back the way these humans do it. There's no, the movie doesn't sell the idea that humans are a cheaper, more convenient, uh, more sustainable uh, source of barbecue <laughs> than, than the traditional pigs and chickens and cows would be. I, I could see that. This is a bit of a stretch, but the, <laughs> the cows are not owned by them. The presented cows are at a slaughterhouse near next okay. door. Raising cows is expensive, time-consuming, required organization. Humans just wander into your property and you knock them over the head and then you eat them. And you didn't have to, you didn't have to model their birth and, and feed them and, and contain them. They just wandered onto your property and knocked them over the head. So it'd be like if a fox came in uh, to your home and you shot it, as opposed to raising fox, getting that fox into your home and shooting it, you know, a random fox would be easier in a sense than having to figure out how to breed fox and then raise them and then slaughter them. So they don't, they don't have the capital to invest in, in, the, in the farm animals? Lack of capital and lack of organization. Hmm. Because the gas station just brings people in every half hour. Someone else is coming in. Oh, okay. Well, we'll position these individuals to maybe come into the home and we'll, we'll eat them as opposed to trying to organize cows. And they, now you have to go to market and you got to sell it. There's an intersection of both commerce, social life, banking, all sorts of systems that you have to interface with as opposed to humans wander in and I eat human. You do make a strong case for upending our meat supply. Well, it only works in, in small family settings, I would imagine. I have a, perhaps a final question for you. Did Leatherface wind up wearing a new face towards the end of the movie? It seemed more white in the second half and less leathery. Was this a, a face that he took from one of the early teenage victims? Yeah, so there's a, a possible theory on, on this Leatherface character that I'll kind of pose to you and get your feedback on. Short answer, yes. It appears that Leatherface 
puts on a mask dependent on the activity that he's engaged in. I guess he had a, a younger face mask on that was maybe a little bit more generic as he's just around the home and the individuals wander into his house. So he's not prepared to manage them. He just has to manage them on the fly. But then later he's donning a different mask that is what looks like an older lady with makeup on mm -hmm. as he's preparing a meal or cleaning up the house. He's fulfilling more of a domestic duty. And so under that role, he s swaps out masks to, to better reflect who he is presenting externally. So, yeah, that makes sense because he's sort of the mother of the, in the traditional sense of the mother being responsible for the, the cooking. And the, I see that now that you mentioned that. And so there's this existential concept or parable maybe called speaking of the gaze. I'll kind of explain what this is. So the setup is such that when someone looks at me and their gaze is upon me, I am then, then limited and objectified by their concept of me. And then therefore I animate myself in the world under that new definition. Here's the kind of setup. I'm an individual looking through a keyhole and no one can see me. And I'm looking through this keyhole and seeing the room on the other side. And I, as an individual, define myself as I want. I am who I create myself to be, and I can be pretty much anyone or anything. I'm looking through this keyhole and projecting my life into this possibility, and no one is looking at me. Two minutes later, someone walks up the staircase behind me and sees me looking through this keyhole. At that moment, my self-definition collapses, and I become, in a sense, who that person sees me as. And I have a self-awareness that is created and now I am someone looking through a keyhole or any number of definitions that I self-impose after knowing that one is looking at me. Through the gaze, I have distilled down my identity based on how that person perceives me or how I think that person perceives me because I have no way of fully knowing what that person is thinking right now. So it's, it's reduced me in a sense. So there's a, there's a keyhole. And you're looking through the keyhole mm -hmm. and then somebody comes up behind you and your view through the keyhole has changed. Your self-concept of yourself has changed. And, and what, what connection do you see uh, to Texas Chainsaw Massacre? So in, in reference to Leatherface, his self-definition is maybe empty to begin with or maybe without texture. And so his self-concept is limited. He then puts on this mask that accomplishes two things. One is that the external world that he has difficulty understanding how they might think of him. He's defined that himself by putting on the mask of the older woman and he's doing chores. He's both internally referencing this mask and presenting himself externally. It's kind of sophisticated in a, in a sense that the world sees him as the duties that he's doing. So he's the socialization aspect that the gaze would provide or the self-definition aspect that the the gaze would provide is being objectified by wearing the mask. I put on the old lady mask when I'm doing duties that are associated with being an older woman or a housekeeper. And I understand myself only through putting this mask on because my self-representation is so decayed or non-functional that without wearing this mask, I don't, even, I don't even know who I am. I'm in a way like defining myself by using this mask. So I'm, I have an awareness as to what that part of me or a part of someone might do. But I'm also very limited as to who I am based on that putting on of the mask. I guess for an, a character who's not really verbal, like Leatherface is, is nonverbal, it's tough to differentiate the original mask activities and the later um mother mask activities mm -hmm. like uh, when he's sitting down at dinner yeah he's wearing the old lady mask but he's also helping grandpa to hold the hammer and uh participating in the attempted slaughter of the young lady so the, it's not like he goes goes into a completely different space in terms of his character and behavior 
Mm-hmm. He's still he's still menacing and all that. He's not running around with a chainsaw anymore. But I don't know. I don't. I didn't know it. Notice at the. I guess at the end, yeah, he's wearing like a suit almost when he when he goes outside and chases him. And uh, when hitchhiker guy gets run over, he's kind of wearing a suit. I don't know if he had a different mask on or not. It, you know, it would be difficult for him to have a mask for all, all the different duties that he might have to find himself within. So just like yourself and I, it's, we fulfill many different roles within a particular day and a different part of us animate and, and move us through that role. And the world sees us differently as we're doing that role. So if I go to a shop and I buy something, I have become a customer and the people working in the shop see me as a customer. I leave that shop and now I'm just a member of society or a community. And those on the street look at me and think, oh, does this guy live in this community? Does this guy, this guy is part of our community. So I have become a different human based on who's looking at me. And then I come into my house and people that I'm living with see me as their partner or their roommate. And I've become a different person fundamentally based on who's looking at me or who's interacting with me. So in regard to Leatherface, he would have to wear a different mask depending on all three of those different situations. He'd wear a shopper's mask and then a community mask and then a brother mask, I guess, in relation to his family. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a sophisticated part where he knows that he is a different person under these different duties, but there's a rudimentary part where he doesn't seem to have a consistent self-identity that carries through these three different duties or situations. Maybe he doesn't see himself as a consistent identity through these three different spaces. That's a, a deeper dive into his character than I thought the movie was um, going to give us. I can't say it's intentional, but that's what it appears to me. Well, it does explain why he has, he's got the leather apron on at the beginning and then later on, yeah, kind of dressed like a woman playing the role of mom of the family i don't understand why he would revert to a suit and tie for the final chase scene there are portions of the film two of them come to mind within the cinematography of it one is the vulnerability that is created for the individuals in in the van and i'm not really differentiating the different characters because i don't think any of them have a full enough structure that's that's worth teasing apart, basically just have people who are vulnerable stumbling on to a threatening, destructive situation. But there's one viewpoint that it creates a, a vulnerability due to the way that the women are dressed, their, you know, their backs are exposed. There's an individual who is wheelchair bound, so they are immobile in certain ways and vulnerable in themselves. They're driving a van that runs out of gas that brings in a lack of independence or escape from situation. So it's these compounding variables that bring in a sense of vulnerability to the group. And I would say the camera angles at times are low to the ground and looking up. And at first I thought, oh, wow, this gives scale. But after I I thought about it for a bit, I feel that that's trying to put the audience in a space of their own vulnerability as a child. You're young, you're looking up at these adults who you give your power to or the guidance to, and I'm placed in a, in a space that I don't necessarily give weight to in the moment because it's a camera angle and I'm just watching a movie, but the fact that it's lower and looking up, there's a childlike presence there where... I'm very vulnerable in this space as I remember as a child from this viewpoint. And that, that maybe brings in a, a feeling of un- uneasiness or inability to escape as the viewer of the group that's being terrorized. Hmm. Well, final thoughts on Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Could, could it happen again? That's my main question. <laughs> well, yeah. And to clarify, this wasn't a true event. I mean, Ed Gein was an individual who slaughtered people that came to his home. And I I think he ate them as well, but there wasn't a family associated with it or, uh, you know, a whole, you know, chainsaw aspect to it. But I had seen this a long time ago and I didn't remember particularly caring for it, but upon a second viewing or maybe even third viewing, it actually held up really well. I think that the, 
the elements that it included, both visually with them kind of walking through, walking to the barn, and, and you saw the sunflowers and such, and the and it was very colorful, and the environments are very easy to fall into. The grain structure on the film gives it like a gritty documentary kind of feel to it. And the cinematography, I think, brought you into it. it had like the close zoom in shots with uh, the lady who was being terrorized at the end and, and kind of the, the other viewpoint that I articulated earlier. So I think that it really held, held up better than I would have guessed and felt short. I mean, it was maybe it was short, but it was it was only like an uh, hour and 20 minutes. And although the, none of the characters were particularly kind of colored in, in any meaningful way, that didn't seem to bother me. And in other movies, I would kind of cite that as a complaint that there there wasn't really substance brought into the the, the characters. But that didn't bother me for whatever reason. Yeah, I think um, a, a, a giant human wearing a leather apron and a, and a human face mask with a chainsaw it makes it work. Regardless of uh, yeah, irritating teenage characters and and not a lot of blood and all that, uh, I think Leatherface and his hawkish squeaks carry the film. In in my opinion, what I'm what I'm saying is that Leatherface is uh, what makes Texas Chainsaw Massacre work. You enjoyed it? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, okay. I, 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 was, no. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. I guess uh, it needs to be seen. Uh, it's one of those, uh, like I started the show with uh, historically early horror movies. I feel like I've uh, ticked a box on my resume of horror viewer. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I, I didn't find it uh, terribly scary or gory or containing a viable uh, political message uh, or, or even anything about motivation it was pretty pretty empty and poorly made in that regard but like i said giant guy with uh, a chainsaw kind of just keeps your attention for 75 minutes <laughs> so that's what it is all right well yeah let's uh <laughs> let's uh carry on and uh orient ourselves to maybe a safer space yeah i think uh heading north uh is is usually the right move if only we could know which direction north is <laughs> 